So. Great. Thank you so much for joining us again for Let's Talk and thank you for being uh, supportive of uh, the Bedford Playhouse. And we're delighted to have tonight Jen Gaita Siciliano for what proves to be what will prove to be a very, very interesting talk and one of her colleagues, uh, Jessica Silverman. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. They're going to give us a short uh, presentation, then I'm going to come back on and we'll have questions and go from there. And thank you so much. And I wanted to mention one thing. We were just talking about the fact that some of you have signed up in groups and you're, you may be watching this as a group. If you'd like your email to be input and so that we can follow up with you and send you materials, we'd be happy to do that if you just let us know. So anyway, without further ado, uh, Jen and Jessica, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Vanessa and Bedford Playhouse. I'm so thrilled to be here and to be talking about what I find to be so important, which is mental health and mental illness. Um, my name is Jen Gata Siciliano, and I am an artist, I'm a writer, and a, a podcaster, creator, and host of Not As Crazy As You Think podcast. I am also trying to get uh, my Not As Crazy As You Think book out there. So the story that I'll be talking about tonight is woven into that uh manuscript. So, um, but I'm thrilled to have this conversation and be a part of this talk because it is so important, especially today's age. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, Jen, thank you uh, for having me and the Bedford Playhouse. Uh, my name is Jessica Silverman. I am a mentor and wellness expert for spiritual women uh, seeking freedom to live in complete alignment in mind, body, spirit, emotions for mental wellness and anxiety therapy uh, using a very whole body healing approach. Uh, I personally stepped away from a six figure income uh, back seven years ago, uh, working in venture capital to start my own venture and podcasting is what inspired that. So I'm also the host of the Alive podcast. It's an acronym, A-L-I-V-E, which stands for Alignment of Love, Inspiration, Vitality and Energy. Jen, Jen. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Okay, so I, should I just go into it? I'll tell you a little bit about my myself then. Um, basically, I had a hell of an experience when I was 22 years old, and it uh, pretty much created the trajectory of my life. Um, and in ways that I would never have wanted, but um, that's why I'm here to tell you about it. So uh, 1994, uh, days during which, you know, there were really no cell phones available or uh, in, uh, easily uh, accessible internet. And um, I decided to go to India. A friend of mine uh, vis uh, asked me to visit his homeland. And um, I had really no business going. I wasn't the type to have any experience with travel. My family never had any experience with travel. But I said, you know what? I want to write a story. I'm going to go over there. At the time, I was living in New York City, uh, working at the Museum Natural, uh, American Museum of Natural History, and uh, you know, showcasing my artwork. And uh, I was involved with theater. I was doing a show. So um, I, I just I wanted to see something more. I was, uh, I, I grew up in an, uh, a family that was uh, immigrants. And I said, you know what, I feel like there's something out there for me to see. And I got that. Uh, I went to India and uh, I saw things that I never saw before. So um, it was a cultural shock. At first, I didn't really experience the shock. I experienced the shock when I came home to New York. But um, there was uh, the place that I stayed in New Delhi, it was a Brahmin home, and there was a little bit of a cultural misunderstanding. Um, I was asked to leave the house, something so simple. I called uh, my friend arrogant in front of his parents, but that was big because I was uh, coming from, you know, being a uh, free and swinging, uh, you know, feminine energy in New York City. And it, this was a very traditional home. So I was asked to leave. But unfortunately, I started experiencing extreme abdominal pain. And it ended up turning into like a three day affair with, you know, absolute um, dehydration, vomiting, diarrhea, very extreme um, debilitation. 
And I was on my own, just pretty much roaming the streets of New Delhi, hoping to have someone help me. And I did find a wonderful um, gentleman who was in the sutra class, willing to help me, you know, and, and get me to my emergency flight home on time. It was the ultimate trauma. I didn't know if I was going to survive. I was on my knees praying to be saved um, and just hoping that some kind of voice would guide me. And, and uh, wonderfully so, that's exactly what happened. I heard these voices and they, they led me to my, my plane home. Um, on the flight, I was still extremely disabled, still sick, going to the bathroom to and fro. Um, and then suddenly I had an experience where I took one last inhale and I breathed out and I didn't inhale again. I felt like I came out of my body and it was what many people call a near-death experience. Um, I saw my whole life flash before me. I realized that this was it, and I was thrilled to come home. But what I was told was that it wasn't my time. If I was to die then, my parents would have just been devastated because they didn't want me to go over there. Um, I came home then, you know, I came back into my body. And um, basically, it became a nightmare after that. Uh, I came into New York, when I saw the difference between the reality of the poverty of the other areas of the world, and what New York City was saying was most important, which was, make sure you have that, you know, uh, you, if you don't have that moisturizer, you're going to die without it, you know, and I just the what we called with the disconnect, it wasn't a disconnect. It was a coming into my my own, realizing what the world was about. Um, however, I couldn't sustain my upset, my trauma. I was completely beside myself and I really wasn't able to communicate to others. And I had a breakdown. Uh, my family didn't know what to do. They brought me into this the emergency room um, where I was psychiatrically evaluate, evaluated um, and then just hospitalized, labeled, medicated and told for the, that I'd have to give up my dreams for the rest of my life and accept a lifelong regimen of antipsychotic treatment. Um, I didn't want to live with that, but I had to. And that's, what was your diagnosis? I'm sorry to interrupt. What was yeah, your no, absolutely. What were they labeling you as? They labeled me with bipolar disorder. Um, and, you know, the thing is, it didn't come immediate. The label came a little later. They felt that definitely the psychosis was there, but there was no discussion about where my mind was, what was my experience, the environmental triggers that occurred. They didn't want to hear about India. Now, this was, again, in 1994, but nowadays, um, the uh, traditional Western psychiatry does not consider context. They consider behavior. So this is still part of the biomedical model, the, the approach of the system. And really, I guess what I'm here to say is there's other ways to heal. And there's other ways to look at these things because this was clearly a traumatic experience and that wasn't even investigated by the people who said that they were professionals. So I really became very careful uh, about listening, but I had no choice because I was on extremely heavy medication that completely took away my creativity. I wasn't able to paint anymore. I'd gone to school to paint and write and um, it just took everything away from me. Um, and now, here I am at 50 years old, after 27 years of being on these meds, I've decided within this last year, um, and I've been working steadily on it for over a year now, trying to taper off these meds. Um, it's given me so much more uh, joy, the experience of emotions that I can now access that I couldn't for so long. Um, these medications aren't designed to replace something that's missing. They're designed to sedate you. And um, sometimes that's needed. Sometimes we experience extreme states of stress and we don't know what else to do but stop the state of stress. But the exit plan is never discussed. There is no exit plan in psychiatric medication. It's usually prescribed for life or good luck getting off yourself is very little help.
may I ask you, what was the role that your parents were playing in all of that? Because you were 22 when you first came back. And also, what are the specific medication in case, medications in case someone in our audience is dealing with trying to taper off of those? Right. Um, well, when my parents first were involved, um, they stayed involved for most of my life. And uh, that's also one of the, I think, things that I don't uh, subscribe to anymore. This idea of it, like kind of infantilizing our lives, you know, uh, if you are suffering or if you have trauma or if you experience a mental illness, you are then placed in the hands of a caretaker in some capacity. Uh, so my parents really represented that for so long. And then later on, even up until 2017, I had a very extreme, um, uh, hospitalization where, you know, they were involved and they shouldn't have been involved and there were misunderstandings. You know, I mean, I'm a grown woman now and things were just not understood. And um, now things are a little better. That was six years ago. And I had to pull away almost like there's this sense of you have to kill your parents sometimes in your imagination. I've had to kill, I guess, the old relationship I had with my parents so that I can grow into a normal um, adult relationship with my parents. But that was because I had to finally say, you know what, you're accepting the narrative as is all these years, I need to start writing a new narrative for myself. One of the things that we think at Let's Talk that's very important is that the, there's a lot of stress and emphasis on the caregiver, a lot of stress on parents. And unfortunately, um, the uh, medical community can't necessarily discuss things openly. And that's one of that's one of the things that we think is very important to talk about. So anyway, I, I apologize for interrupting. Go no, ahead. absolutely. And, and that's important information. Absolutely. Um, for the medicines, just to, you know, uh, talk about that, I was put on antipsychotics and stayed on those. But throughout, um, I've probably been on 20 different ones. Um, in the beginning, there were very heavy ones like Haldol and Melaril and um, Thorazine and Later on, I was put on Depakote, which helped me create, you know, nine to five lifestyle for myself that seemed to put every, keep everything in check. Um, and I hated it. I hated my life because I couldn't paint and I couldn't do the things I cared about most, which was expressing myself creatively. And then later I uh, got on Lamictal, which is what I'm currently still tapering off from and as well as Seroquel. So I have a poly right now, but I'm coming, you know, I'm coming along and it's just been, it's been thrilling because it's possible. It's possible. And for people who don't know what tapering off is, can you please describe that? Or are you working with somebody to do that in a safe way? Yes. Um, I will say that, and this goes out to many parents, just so that, you know, um, there is no, again, there's no uh, teaching to the psychiatric profession to how, how to get people off the drugs. The idea is to get them on, get them stable. Now they're biochemically aligned. But if you want to do that, it is a solitary uh, choice. You're not always going to be supported by the medical industries. You might need to find something extremely alternative. Um, I found someone who I swear by, she's wonderful. She's a medical marijuana doctor who's helping me transition through a, a support with, with cannabis treatment. Um, and also, you know, it's not just THC, you know, everyone thinks of it as, oh, we're getting high. No, there's all different kinds now of uh, treatments and particularly like something like CBN is helping me because that's just designed for sleep. It's just a terpene. It's nothing. It doesn't make you high. So these are uh, alternatives. So she's able to write scripts because she's also an OBGYN. So I'm very lucky. You really do need to enroll someone to write these scripts for tapering because you do not want to take it down all at once. Most people who have failed have been um, experienced, I, uh, um, I forgot what it's called, but uh, you know, basically damage to the nervous system. So you cannot do this quickly. You need to take the time to do it. And what they've found over the course of many, many years of patients uh, voluntarily giving their information over to uh, websites such as like uh, survivingantidepressants.com, they have collected all this information from all the people who have tried to do this. And what they found is that the best way to taper is to 
take the dose down 10% of the previous month's dose, not, not from the beginning, but from the previous month's dose. So it does take a long time. I mean, like I said, I'm probably going to have to take the full, an, another full year to do it. So in the end, it'll probably take me about two years, but that's the correct way to do it so that you don't throw your nervous system into despair. Would you like to bring Jessica into the conversation now? Absolutely. Um, Jessica and I met at a podcast conference. Um, and I'm so thrilled that I did meet up with her. I actually attended her meetup session during podcast, I mean, uh, PodFest Origins. Um, she hosted a mental health and podcasting hosting hard conversations group. And it was thrilling because I saw that she also had lived experience in her own way. And she came to podcasting with the, the, the intention of sharing her views on this and wishing to help people. And right now I'm involved with her latest program, which is Live Vibrant, Eight Weeks to Amp Up Your Life. She's a great coach and I'm thrilled that she could join us today. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, thank you, Jen, for having me. It's really a pleasure. So Jessica, would you like to tell us your story? Sure, sure. And, so and, and, and be sure to tell us what whole body healing really is, if you don't mind, please. Exactly, yeah. So to me, I mean, whole body healing can mean, I'll start there, different to different people, right? So typically we think of, right, mind, body, um, consciousness, spiritual energy, right? Mind, emotions, um, physical energy, different types of energy, right? Energy is everything. Einstein said it best. Um, but my approach is really intertwining conscious energy and subconscious energy and subconscious even more so because that is rooted more in my story. So I don't have a conscious experience as to why, or I actually was never on medication, but I suffer daily still to this day with panic attacks, massive anxiety and depression, which is why I use my podcast, not only as a tool to give others voice, but to give myself a voice, and you, you said it best, Vanessa, about let's talk, right? These conversations don't happen, but this is where happening, this is where the healing is, right? We have to move through these emotions. One of the best books I ever read um, was from Cheryl Paul, right? About anxiety, how anxiety can be the answer, right? If we can tune into our emotions, if we have a modality of either having sp safe spaces or someone to talk to who's a professional who's been there, who comes from a place of compassion, who is not reading through a black book to diagnose, this is where the healing happens to get to the root cause of not only why we're feeling depressed, anxious, chronic pain, I have clients with all of the above, but where did it even come from the past, right? It may even go back. So there's t four different types of trauma. Uh, that I work through, right? Big T trauma, little T trauma. So big T is Jen's uh, situation as well, right? Like big life events, like near death experiences or a death and loss in the family or a tragic event, right? That you are a part of something you witnessed. Little T is kind of the everyday stresses that we go through. Then there's collective trauma, which is, we've all been a part of through this pandemic, right? And we're still moving through that collective trauma and that's the global trauma. And then there's intergenerational trauma which is where a lot of my trauma now that I'm doing the work and of course serving my clients in the same capacity because right coaches have to have coaches as well I, I'm still in therapy working through my own journey of inner bonding therapy right which is inner child healing it's intergenerational meaning it can go back up to seven generations of trauma right so like Jen I am a first generation American of immigrant parents who were the first generation post-world war ii who my grandparents suffered right in the Holocaust. And then we can go back, you know, up to seven generations of that, which there wasn't a place for even my parents, even to this day, to even talk openly about their emotions. I, I can't talk about it at home. And so then I grew up as a child that had suppressed emotions, that didn't know that it was okay to say that I'm not okay or to say how I'm feeling physically or emotionally, right? Or even spiritually, these conversations weren't welcomed, right? And as an adult, you know, I can't look back to blame my parents, right? Now it's a matter of me being the inner parent to my inner child and learning how to have that conversation because it not only affects me, it affects everyone I'm in relationship with, it affects how I can serve my clients. And then thinking it goes seven generations back 
I don't have children, but when I do, and then they have children and they have children, I don't want to pass on the same trauma that I experience every single day. So that's why I've become a huge advocate. Um, as Jen mentioned, I have my Live Vibrant program, which is a healing sisterhood and a circle uh, to find alternative methods of healing that does not involve the traditional pharma method. Uh, I'm just not a fan of that. I've seen too much in my own experience. Um, from my family, I had a friend who died at the age of 27 uh, from pill overdose. So I have taken that experience uh, personally to help others through that. And a lot of my clients, I try to help them wean off medication through natural methods, right? Through learning a lot of spiritual ritual, right? Having a morning practice, you know, learning the Akashic records, learning your human design, uh, astrology, tarot. Uh, these are all healing modalities that can help us, of course, meditation to learn the subconscious mind because that that's the mind that runs in the background that's the mind that you're not aware of why you're sad you know i actually heard uh, trevor hall and if you know the musician he was on a hay house summit for mental health and he said i'm all, often sad and depressed and I, I just don't know why i don't have like a big story and it was the first time that i ever related to somebody speaking of mental health because i said that's me like some days i just wake up and i'm sad and i don't know why but there's probably something subconsciously that's buried deep within some emotions, some past trauma, some experience that I'm not aware of. And I think sometimes that's even more dangerous because you, you don't know what to do, right? You don't know even what it is. The awareness piece isn't there for you to help yourself or to even ask for help outside of yourself. That's beautifully put. I think, I think what's so interesting is to talk about little t trauma too, because trauma, the words trauma, stigma, all these different things are floating around without anybody ever defining them, talking about them. So I think that's great. That's a great way of talking about things. And I also think that um, PTSD is so much, it's kind of like in our bloodstream right now. I just want to tell you, my dad, my dad was one of the most wonderful guys in the world. He died at 90 and he went through the depression, saved his family, did not graduate from college, was, at, was in World War II and the Korean War. And just before he died, he said, oh, Vanessa, I get what you're talking about. Oh, emotions are important. And I thought, fantastic, you know, fantastic. Okay, can we, I, I would like to ask both of you. I, I love what you've done, um, what you're doing and how you presented yourselves. I'd love to talk about, I'd like to go to Jen first because Jen is such a, I mean, I think the word alternative is such a lovely word because it's against labeling and all these different things, but you're creative, you're out there, you're doing all these different things, your podcasts, you talk about hearing and, and, and sound being very important. You talk about Carl Jung and PTSD. Can you just tell us um, what, what is the most important thing that you'd like the audience today to think about or to kind of like throw out to them to ponder? Yeah, I know. I was always a, a little and a lot outside of the box. And, and that ended up getting me in trouble, you know, but it's all good because it's all coming to fru you know fruition and full circle. So it's all, it's all lovely. Um, but I think, you know, my interpretations of things, um, and especially with the mental illness labels, um, I think is where I really want to uh, stress. Uh, we need to see things alternatively. And uh, because somebody like me, I feel comfortable in my own skin doing things that most people might find crazy or abnormal. I had a face and body ba painting business for over a decade where I just painted naked people. I, you know, I do s submit to, you know, plant medicine, uh, cannabis and psychedelics. I do identify more with indigenous narratives over patriarchal and colonial narratives. I mean, am I crazy? I don't think so. There's a lot more people out there right now who are speaking these uh, realities. Uh, people since COVID especially have realized that, you know what, what everyone says is normal may not be so normal. Working, you know, uh, 80 hours a week. I don't know if that makes so much sense anymore. You know, since uh, some of my family members are dying, like people had to redirect what they saw as abnormal, normal, healthy, um, you know, uh, unbalanced. So yeah, I, I, the funny thing is during the COVID experience, when everyone was kind of out of sorts, I said to myself, wow, this alternative thing is helping me now because I feel very comfortable like just being at home and doing creative stuff and all by myself. I have no problem with that. So 
maybe there's a chance for some of this alternative perspectives to start breaking through to the mainstream. And I think that that there is that. Um, one of the things I try to put forward in my podcast is um, that specific thing about psychosis. Um, shamanism is a, uh, is a type of approach to life that some of us find ourselves in unknowingly. And a lot of the times people find that they have shamanistic traits um, after a near-death experience. And that's something I had to stumble into. So this is a very like alternative. Can you define, can you define shamanism for people? And can you define in your... Um... Uh, definition. Can you define what psychosis is? How you're yeah. talking about the two of them together? Sure, sure. So basically, how the Western view of psychosis uh, reads is that, you know, you are disconnected from reality, you're hearing voices that aren't there, you're seeing things that aren't there. And again, it's very subjective, because the idea is that they're taking your behaviors and your words and they are interpreting it as, okay, well, there's no evidence of, you know, what she's saying. Therefore, she's in another world. She's disconnected from reality. But in the experience of psychosis and those who have had it have been able to get through to the other side, have been able to speak about it and learn, you know, some kind of eloquent way to discuss it. And, and there's so few of us, but so many of us have been strung out on these antipsychotics and it's very hard to, to gather your thoughts about this because it's, it's an alternative way of looking at it. Um, it's, is, it's much more than that. There's things going on in our, um, understanding and interpretation of the symbols in psychosis. When you're in psychosis, you are kind of removed from the 3D and you see things broken down in symbols, in um, different kinds of narratives. You might hear voices, but to me, when I was in those experiences, they were so safe. And I knew that the first time I entered it, it was so safe because it got me home from India and it saved my life. So that was always the starting point for me. I said, I have to trust this because I know that when I listened to these voices before, I got back into America. So I trusted it maybe more than I, you know, other people have. And I uh, ended up learning that other indigenous cultures, they have, when people go through these experiences, they don't see it as mentally ill. They see it as, oh, it's a gift. You know, this person can now go on to the other side, exist in that world where there's a uh, ethereal world and here's the physical world. And they can kind of go in between and gather through symbolism information, possibly from our ancestors in listening to the voices, possibly from our ancestors or um, other guides and bring home that information to the tribe and actually make an impact. And often a lot of the people who are, who go to see a shaman and they have some kind of mental distress around them, they feel that this is a, a, a real true healing. And I've seen it too, because I've been in shamanic circles where, you know, people have been healed. So I just feel that one of the things I want to get to to the heart of is that what we're being told is abnormal or not true or you know woo woo or whatever we need to be it's very sim much more similar to what others in other cul cultures have have gone through and have been you know um brought through the 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 system in ways that were much different than the way I was brought through the system. I was brought through the system being told I was mentally ill and not gifted. So that's one of the things I really want to point out because hearing voices is a huge hearing voices community. It's one of the biggest communities um, with people who are labeled with bipolar or schizophrenic because or schizophrenia because one of the things that they go through is psychosis and hearing voices. And many people are coming to the table with new stories and new narratives that are less path, uh, pathology based and more, you know, solistically based. And I think that we need to open up to that more. That's so interesting. And also, I think um, some of the things you're talking about have to do with the whole idea that artists see things differently. And so some of this might, might I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but might somehow 
be in some category that en enhances or embraces some of that. But but Jen, what would you what what do you think is the most important thing for you to talk about to the audience? Oh, I'm sorry, you mean me or Jessica? Je sorry, Jessica. I'm sorry. I actually agree with Jen. This is a good kind of trans off a transition point um, to continue the conversation on alternative perspectives, right? Seeing things from more of the Eastern tradition versus the colonialist, the Western world. Uh, and that's something that, that me not feeling a part of society, um, I don't necessarily call myself a shaman, but I do subscribe to the five clairs, right? I, I see things, I hear things, I experience things differently. I always have, I think differently than most people and I never knew why, right? But in American culture specifically, they subscribe that like something is wrong with you, right? It's you subscribe to the thought that something is wrong with you. Um, you know, I went through so many jobs and then you're labeled as unstable, right? Which then, you know, when I get in my fits and rages or panic attacks, it's well, now you need to psychiatric help. And, and that would just send me into a spiral because I know just like Jen, that I don't wanna put a label on it. I don't believe in that traditional system that, that people that are different and, and misunderstood per se, that maybe the perception is that it's a gift or maybe it's just something that we as a collective need to understand and embrace rather than ostracize. And so that's something that, that I believe wholeheartedly uh, and that I teach and I speak about, you know, almost every single day is to embrace this Japanese concept called Shoshin, which is beginner's mind. You know, I actually have a beautiful quote I want to share with you that really explains it well. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. But in the expert's mind, there are few. Shunryu Suzuki, right? So we all revere experts, but who are these experts, right? Like you said, Jen, what is normal? What is real? Like these are the questions that we should be asking instead of, right, a diagnosis or particular labels, right, that we put on ourselves and on society and everyone around us is really just asking questions. Because with, neurologically, when we ask questions, we are guided, right? This is science, it's not even spirit. We are guided to find those answers, right? The brain, the conscious brain connects to the subconscious brain and we are forced to, to see those answers, right? Even if we don't know them right away, the brain still remembers. That's the subconscious, right? That's always working in the background. So that's that's the message that, that I really wanna convey. There are sort of three bigger points that I have that I, I think are really important. Um, you know, number one is, is to have a morning ritual. The way you start your day, I always started my day in depression and I didn't know how to take the day from, from there, right? And so how you start your day, and I still a lot of days wake up that way, but now I have a way to help myself every morning, the first hour, two hours of every day, to be in complete silence, to tune myself out of the world. Technology especially has crippled our younger generation, being constantly connected to these devices. We don't even know what the impact of 5G technology is gonna be years from now, along with everything else that we're being exposed to, right, in big pharma, the long-term effects of all of that. So we have to have natural ways, right? And again, this is my whole body healing perspective to heal this trauma, right? To hop on an app like Insight Timer, which is free. There's 50,000 plus recordings of meditations, positive talks, live streams, where you can connect. There's communities and circles on there of other people just like you who are seeking that help, right? It, it, it can cost absolutely nothing, right? So it's available to everyone community, same thing. I have my own Live Vibrant community, but during the pandemic, I connected to a part of other communities, one of them being the Daybreaker community, which is focused on the concept of what they call DOS. Um, they work with the Greater Science Center in Berkeley, which is basically through dance, through ritual, through shamanism, through all these spiritual practices to activate the four neurochemicals, which combats mental illness, which is dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. So that was a beautiful community for me to be a part of because isolation, long-term isolation, which we all experienced in the pandemic, some of us still, is the equivalent of smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. So does it matter? Absolutely, right? We cannot continue. I mean, virtual spaces like this are beautiful when they're healing, but most of what goes online is not. Right. And we're absorbing, you know, our aura, we're sharing our whole lives on social media, our news, 
we don't know what that does to our auric field. And so I think it's really important to protect our energy, to have communities and spaces and personal ritual of awareness and silence really to just sit in silence. I mean, think about how hard that is to just breathe in, breathe out for five minutes without an obtrusive thought is so difficult. But in Eastern traditions, it's not. They sit and meditate for two, three, four, five hours a day. So, I mean, that right there is just telling. I think that's great because you're talking about process. You're talking about basically a lot of a lot of these um, strategies or mechanisms or things that you do to to kind of tiptoe through your day. Yeah. And and Jen, can you talk about that same thing? Because I think it's just it's just a really brilliant way of it's a really positive and brilliant way of thinking about the way we can help ourselves. What do you do? What's what's your process of your day? Just in terms of strategy. Um, I really try to incorporate as much as possible creativity. And I think that what we all experienced during COVID, I think really honestly, COVID, you know, I lost someone very, very close to me. So we all suffered in some capacity. Um, So, you know, there's that kind of mixture. Do we feel sad about it? Do we feel good about it? We have to walk away with something positive. So I think what I experienced was that I was just so joyful that everybody was doing creative stuff. And it's, it's known now through neuroscience and they're, they're working with this every day on all these different studies that, you know, art is, and music are things that change you at the cellular cellular level. So if we can actually access some kind of hands-on creativity outside of just like passively receiving like a TV, you know, something that, you know, we all enjoy as well, but, you know, something that's hands-on. Um, also dream analysis, I think find to be very in- interesting because I work with a dream therapist and he's amazing. Um, Warren Falcon, I'll mention him. And he seems to um, really uh, understand the Carl Jungian approach, which is, you know, we are all connected with this collective unconscious. And if we understood the symbols that are given to us in, in while we are unconscious, we might be able to really tap into the things that show up and manifest through our physical reality because they're teaching us things. So it's almost like a way for that realm to communicate with us as well. So to be open to that. Also, what's very important for people- Can I just ask a quick question before you go on? What do you do with Warren? What is what is that? Do you talk on the phone? Do you- Yeah, he's like my therapist. He's a dream therapist. He's my therapist, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, you, go ahead. And that's uh, another point too, just just generally uh, therapy is- widespread you can do all different kinds of therapy so he ended up he ended up really resonating with my style because we speak the same terminology our when i speak symbols um he understands them and those are the kinds of words that come out when i'm in a shamanic journey uh, or psychosis right so he understands that vocabulary so my 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 reminder to people is just, you know, connect with somebody who shares the same vocabulary. You don't have to, you know, all agree uh, with, we don't have to agree with every therapist that's out there, but if you find one person who can be on your team, that's, that alleviates a lot of stress for, I would also say for bipolar personality types, um, we like to stay up late. Okay. That can be detrimental. So sleep hygiene, really, really important. Um, I, you know, anything that you could do to really try to relax yourself at night, I've had to like give up a lot of working at night because it was just keeping me up too late. Um, and that's changed things. And also for me personally, nutrition is key because it's again, what do you put into your body? You are what you eat. You know, we've learned this since we were kids and it's really, really true. And oftentimes what happens, what shows itself in a physical problem, um, and, you know, biologically, or you're experiencing symptoms that translate as mental illness could often be uh, rooted in some kind of inflammatory issue. And if you could get some, you know, of your eating habits under control, a lot of these symptoms can subside on their own. So I, I, I really am a big proponent of that. I'd like to ask you, what do you do for sleep hygiene? Well, like I said, right now I'm doing cannabis treatment. I turn out, you know, turn off the TV at 10 o'clock at night. I, you know, have my tea. I, you know, I read, I try to stretch and relax and, you know, put myself inside the bed. 
because then you just get tired. You just, you know, you fall asleep. Try not to also look at the phone too much at night. That's a biggie. <laughs> Great. I'd like to, I'd like to go to depression because Jessica mentioned depression. I'd like to ask you, Jen, about your work, your, um, your campaign with and about depression. And, um, and then I'd like to Jessica to talk a little bit about depression as well, because it's so ubiquitous and such a very important topic. Depression is uh, huge right now. And any bipolar, you know, uh, most of us swing. And that's the whole idea of bipolarity. You go from mania to depression. And I know right now, um, more so than ever before, people are experiencing it. Teens are experiencing it on, on incredible levels. Um, and I, you know, I just want to give the shout out to, again, any parents who are dealing with this with their children. I, I do have compassion because I don't want to feel like anyone's feeling judged. I don't want anybody to feel judged. Okay. Because we find ourselves, we wake up, we find ourselves in a world that's difficult. Okay. Life is difficult and it's okay to discuss that because that is a form of compassion. So in, in putting, you know, um, energy behind changing ideas around these, these, these overall, uh, mental illness labels, it's really about, you know, explaining that to our young ones, that it's okay to be sad. You know, it's okay to, um, not want to get out of bed sometimes, because if you allow that to be okay, then the conversation begins. Most of the time people don't get help or they get so far in with depression that, you know, it can turn into suicidal ideation or, you know, very serious issues. Um, it's because they don't want to talk about it. And so many people suffer depressive qualities on a, on a, regular basis. I mean, this is part of the human experience. And, and in a way we should be embracing it and, and throwing our arms around people and saying, Hey, you know, like, let's, let's, let me give you a hug. There was this one person I remember just seeing it recently. It was like a, a this little video of this guy took um, of himself being outside and having this big sign saying, Anybody that wants to get a hug, you know, I'm here for you. And everyone came up to him and he just gave all these hugs and had everything on video, you know, and they put it on, on social media. But I was thinking to myself, I know that what those people feel like, cause we all do, right? Sometimes you just walking in your, 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 uh, shoes and you're saying this sucks <laughs> and that's okay. It's okay to be, oh, you know, not okay. So, um, a big that's a big thing that we have to remind kids because this uh toxic positivity sometimes is a narrative that gets out there a little too much and it's okay to to not feel so great because that's how you get through it and may i ask you what uh, specifically during covid what are you thinking about and seeing because you've recently returned to your work in schools yeah interesting that you mentioned that i used to teach i was a teacher for 14 years i was an english teacher um which was uh interesting and then when my son was born i went to do my face and body painting business but COVID ended that i just did not want to go back to that after the whole scare so um i i'm now teaching in new york city schools again and i'm doing um i'm teaching art which is wonderful because then I can bring, you know, uh, that deeper part of myself, the thing that I'm most passionate about, the thing that was taken away from me in my twenties that I couldn't, I couldn't teach art because I couldn't even do art, couldn't think like that anymore from, because of the meds. So doing that with the kids is great. And because what I noticed and a lot of these kids, you know, I mean, they all have, you know, behavioral issues when they are told that they could, they don't have to do like, too much thinking and they could just relax and touch materials and and just focus on creating something cool all of a sudden the 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 most difficult children have connected to something deeper and you see that you know you see the power of what art can do so yeah it's it's really exciting to be back in the classroom and and, and know that creativity is i'm able to be Great. That's so great. And Jessica, would you like to talk about talk about working and also specifically some of the, some more about depression and how that resonates? 
Yeah, so a, a lot of what I see in depression, I mean, myself personally and with a lot of my clients is cognitive dissonance, right? So not living an aligned life, meaning we think one thing, but we do another, right? And as human beings, we do this every single day. But when it becomes rampant in all areas of our life, so spiritually, in our relationships, in our career, right, in our health and wellness, that's what causes depression because we are fighting and anxiety. But depression is the long term effect of suppressed emotions, right? I always say on my podcast all the time with all my clients, what is not expressed becomes depressed, which is why Jen said so beautifully creativity, which again is not <laughs> emphasized much in schools, right? That's always kind of subpar to education or to again, the narrative, right? What people want to learn, right? And that's our right brain. That's our feminine brain, right? But a lot of society runs in the masculine. What are you doing? What are you accomplishing, right? Accolades the pressure to perform. And I think our younger generation, especially with technology, it's becoming worse because they're not just allowed to, number one, express how they feel, right? In an open form where they feel safe, you know? I, I got news for you. I, I tell this all the time, hard truth. Uh, it's my background. If you've ever been sad, you've been depressed. So it's okay to say that you've ever been depressed. I mean, obviously there's, there's varying degrees, some more than other. But if you've ever been sad at any point in your life, you've been through depression. And so I think really what's important for everybody to know is that like Jen said, it's okay. It's okay if you're sad, but you need to have a place to express that to a loved one, to a therapist, in community, right? That That is more important now, I think, than ever with this extreme long-term isolation, with technology, right, that again is, is really seeping into our energy centers and our auras every single day. Uh, and myself personally, I'm a highly sensitive person and I didn't know this until a few years ago when I read Elaine's Aaron's book and I watched the documentary, but I always thought, again, there was something wrong with me, but really, I just experience life in high definition, meaning I'm hypersensitive to everyone and everything around me. So that's for the positive, but that also, right, seeps into to the negative aspects, right, of, of vibrations, you know, the negative, the lower frequencies that we can experience as well, right, sadness, depression, anger, right, anxiety. Um, and so the more you learn, again, I think it's just important to understand who you are, right, and to not give yourself a diagnosis, right? I don't subscribe and I don't tell everybody, hey, I'm an HSP, but I just know in my heart that I'm a highly sensitive person. So I need to protect my auric field. I need to make sure that I'm asking myself the right questions, you know, every single day. So I have self inquiry. So I understand if I don't have a means to express that to somebody else, you know, journaling is, is so simple, but it's such great therapy because especially pen to paper, it gets it out of your brain and onto the paper right? That's the easiest solution to cognitive dissonance is just get it out on the paper. Then the third step is, of course, taking small steps, right? And taking action. But just some questions, you know, that I always like to ask my clients as well as myself, you know, these sound simple, but we never ask ourselves these questions. You know, what do I want for my life? What do I want to experience today? Who am I without labels and attachments? Like, who am I? I ask my guests that the very first question when I get on the podcast, who is Jen Gata Siciliano, right? Not the mother, not the podcaster, not, right? Who are you at your core, right? What is my ikigai? That's a Japanese concept, your reason for being, right? When you live your purpose, everyone here on earth, I always say the day you were born is the day the universe decided it needed you, right? So what is that? Because that is what gets you out of bed every day. There's actually a beautiful Nestle commercial. If you Google Ikigai Nestle commercial of everyone in the blue zones, which is Japan, they live to 90, 100, right? They have longevity. Why? Because they're proud to work in the fish market. She's proud to teach yoga. He's proud to be, right? Everybody has their, their purpose and that gets them out of bed every day. You know, how do I want to feel? And if I'm not feeling that, why? Why am I not feeling the way I want to feel? What can I do about it? Where is the story even rooted in? Because a lot of times the stories, the thoughts we think every single day, they're not even our own. It's stuff we inherited from our parents, from their generation, from past generations. And then we subscribe to these stories, these narratives, right? But that's not who we are. And so I think the more you do this self-inquiry, the self-discovery, the more you will be able to heal through anxiety, right? Depression, because that 
emotion is expressed and not stuck down physically at your heart center, which leads to not only anxiety and depression, but, but pain, inflammation, chronic illness, et cetera. A lot of great, a lot of great ideas there. A lot of really um, important things that people can do. And I do think both of you are talking about, you know, having, you know, when you, when you have meaning in your life, when it's not just about you, it makes a big, big, big difference. And um, I, I'm going to watch the Nestle commercial definitely. Um, and I, and I want to say something else that you're talking about about families. Both of you have mentioned families. You know, it's it's so interesting, the story we keep telling ourselves, like we come up, we have like a couple stories, all of us, and then we tell them in the number of times we tell them, boy, they keep turning and changing and becoming something else. And they really get big. They get really big. And um, it's very interesting that you were talking about kind of like cutting, you know, not cutting, but dissolving bits of that over time so that's really great i'd love we could go on forever but i'd like to ask you both to say whatever you want to say to wrap up um and this has been so interesting and we cannot thank you enough but anyway uh jen i'm going to ask you first to talk about whatever you'd like to talk about to finish up okay so one of the things um i just want to give people are some resources okay and and just the overriding advice that healing is possible Okay, this idea that we are, you know, diagnosed, now we have lifelong illness, it's not reality, people, they heal from cancer. Okay, this, if, if you're telling me that I have problems in my brain, and there's no evidence of that, there's no tests for chemical imbalances. These are old theories of the past that have been de debunked. There is no um, biomarkers for these illnesses that they say that you have. And that's something that we should really understand because, you know, we say it's scientific, but if there's no science to back up this diagnosis, then, okay, then it's a story. Okay. We can accept that it's a narrative. Okay. This is the way the, the system works. So if I would just say that if you are coming to terms with dissatisfaction with the treatment that you're receiving from traditional uh, mental health system please be open. Know that there's always a chance to heal. There's so many things out there online right now. There's uh, tons of um, peer support networks um, on social media groups, uh, Instagram, Twitter, all these different things. I have found so many. If you are interested in getting off of um, withdrawing from psychiatric medications, I would just, again, advise you not to do it quickly. Um, and you can go to websites like, like anti, uh, uh, excuse me. Um, oh, uh, surviving antidepressants.com. Also, if you're looking at, um, just a general, um, challenging perspective to traditional Western, uh, psychiatry, you could look at madinamerica.com. They have a, a, an enormous amount of resources and um, writers who are also, you know, uh, therapists in the mental health field that can give you information. Um, and also, there are a lot of good psychiatrists out there who are holistic psychiatrists today. Uh, two of them who I highly recommend, Dr. Ronnie and Dr. Siraj, they have their mental wealth mastery. Uh, you could look that up and you'll be very happy to find that they are, you know, creating a community of, of other therapists and coaches and teaching them like a new knowledge base of, you know, what it is, uh, what functional medicine is and, you know, getting to the root of the, the problems that may be lying there. Um, also peer support networks are huge. And um, another one that de deals with uh, psychiatric uh, uh meds withdrawal is the inner compass. Um, and also Haya Grossberg, who was, was originally going to join us tonight. She has a book called Freedom from Psychiatric Drugs, a manual and workbook for psychiatric survivors. So I wanted to put that all out there for you because um, I didn't know where to turn years ago. I had no idea where to start. And just a few things there I think would be helpful if anybody's on the same path as I was. And Jen, that's great. I also want to mention that one of the people that you um, had in your podcast is Angie Peacock, who was featured and really um, very important in a documentary called Medicaid Normal, which is um, chock-a-block full of information for anybody considering 
um, this very, very serious thing of, of getting off of meds and very um, has to be taken, has to be done very, very, very carefully, but it's a great film, Medicating Normal, and it's on our YouTube. Anyway, Jessica, I'm going to thank you. Thank you, Jen. And Jessica? Yeah, synchronistically, she was also on my podcast. <laughs> I know Jen from PodFest, but ironically, she saw it on my stories and she goes, wow, I'm interviewing her like the same week. So it was very, uh, very spiritually synchronistic there. Um, she was a wonderful guest and resource as well. An amazing documentary, Medicating Normal. But I just want to close with saying question everything. And I think that's just a good mantra, not only for this conversation, but just as a way to navigate through life. Don't accept what you're being told, whether it's a diagnosis, whether it's a prescription, whether it's a label or a story that somebody's told you as, as something that is for you, right? I mean, again, there is no one size fits all approach um, to healing. And so you have to know, right, in your body, right, tune into your body, whether that feels right for you, right? Does it, does it create excitement, you know, in, in your body, in your stomach, in the pit of your stomach? Where do you typically feel the tension? And if you feel that relieved from asking yourself, is this right for me, yes or no? That really is just a tell all, you know, type of experience. So really just, just question everything. Um, find, like Jen said, the resources to write Love on Her Arms is a wonderful charity that I've been a part of for many years. Um, you know, hope is real, your story matters is sort of their mantra. And that's what I wholeheartedly believe that, that we all have a story. If you're not comfortable, you know, making it a lifestyle or a coach coaching business where you help others, then have a private way to do that. You know, whether that's through painting, whether it's through dance, whether that's through plant medicine, you know, and having your own garden, just have a way that expresses your own unique emotions that has your unique blueprint that allows you to release again, a lot of these suppressed emotions. And I just think that that's really important um, to have as a daily, a daily part of your ritual um, is to question everything and to have a way to just be creative, to use again, that right brain, that feminine energy, which is not concerned with time, space, logic. It, it just is, right? The feminine is just one with all that is. That, uh, that's fantastic. This has been, this has been just, um, so important and so um, unusual, unique. Um, all these, all these wonderful ideas that you've given people and resources. I mean, how how thoughtful and engaging and meaningful. So I thank both of you so much, Jen and Jessica, for being here. We so appreciate you being part of Let's Talk, and um, we appreciate all of our audience who joined in. Those of you who signed up and didn't join in, this will be available on YouTube. And here we have Dan, and we're going to thank you for the Playhouse. Thank you, Vanessa, for uh, for moderating. And uh, yeah, and we'll be following up with uh, some links for everybody to uh, take a look at um, at their convenience in the next couple of days. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Take good care. Night.